I wanted to talk today about a great saint that we had this past week, one of the great lights of the Middle Ages, the most glorious era in the entire history of the human race. In those two centuries there, in the 12th and 13th centuries, the human race got further away from the corruption of original sin than it ever has. And the world was in a better condition, not just spiritually, but in every other way than it has ever been. This great era had many, many saints who gave glory to God and the church, but one of the most exalted of these saints was St. Bonaventure, whose feast is on July 14th. He was one of the most highly placed saints in, in Christendom, and as a monk, a bishop, a cardinal, and a doctor of the church, he received just about every honor that the church can give, with the exception of the crown of martyrdom, although he may well have that in heaven too, as we'll see later on. He was the friend and the advisor of popes and kings and other doctors of the church too. But human glory is irrelevant, as impressive as it is, he was as humble and prayerful as he was powerful in the church. St. Bonaventure was born in northern Italy in 1221 of pious parents. When he was a baby, he became very sick until the doctors gave up on him. They thought he was going to die. His mother went to, to see St. Francis of Assisi, who was still alive but was very old at this time, and St. Francis cured her, her little baby, little St. Bonaventure. And he not only recovered his health, but he became so strong that he was not sick from that point again for another day in his life until he died. He loved God very much from the time he was a small child. And when he was 22 years old, he entered the Franciscan order. He studied philosophy and theology, and, and he had a great genius for these subjects. He had an ability to understand the most subtle ideas more than all of his fellow students. But he learned even more in his prayers than he did in his studies. His life was so pure that his teacher, the great medieval theologian Alexander of Hales, said about him that it was almost like he didn't have any original sin, any of its effects. But even though he hardly committed any sins, he was extremely austere and did a lot of penance to protect his, his innocence and his sanctity. And he was so humble that if anyone ever praised him for his genius, he would go out of, the way, out of his way to humiliate himself. Eventually, he was ordained a priest, and when he was in his 30s, he began to teach at the University of Paris. But after a little while, before he could receive his diploma as a professor, he had to stop teaching for a little while because he got caught up into the middle of a dispute among the faculty. Even though these were glorious times, they weren't perfect, and, and people argued then, just like they do now, even good Catholics, and apparently the secular clergy on the faculty of the university became jealous of the success of the new religious orders at the time, especially the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And they tried to, to attack them in various ways, among them, among others, their, their practice of poverty. And the, the leader of these, these secular professors was a man named William of St. Amur, and he wrote a book attacking these monks. He gave his book the rather pretentious title of The Perils of the Last Times, as if these monks were threatening to bring the world to an end. But St. Bonaventure defended the mendicant orders with a book of his own that he called The Poverty of Christ. And another holy man named Blessed John of Parma went and spoke to the Pope on their behalf, Pope Alexander IV. 
And the Pope sided with the monks, and, and he condemned the book with that, that rather silly name. So now that the religious priests, the friars, were restored by the Pope to good standing again, at the university, St. Bonaventure was able to receive his diploma as a professor. Now, St. Bonaventure was a great friend of, of another great saint, also at the university, St. Thomas Aquinas. And the two of them were supposed to receive their diploma in the same uh, commencement ceremony. There's a rather nice story about how the two of them had a long dispute over which of them was going to go up and receive his degree first, each one wanting the other one to go up out of their humility. And it took a while, but finally St. Bonaventure was able to convince St. Thomas Aquinas to go up and get his sheepskin before him. Seems hard to imagine anyone making St. Thomas Aquinas change his mind about anything, but that shows us something of the greatness of, of St. Bonaventure. But what is more important in this story is that this shows how skilled St. Bonaventure was at settling controversies and making peace between people who were, who were arguing, as he did at the University of Paris. And this was a skill that he was called on to use repeatedly throughout his life. He would especially need this skill two years later, when he was chosen at only 35 years old, to be the superior general of the entire Franciscan order throughout the whole world. Anyone at the head of any large organization has to, to keep people from fighting and keep them working together. But especially at this time, the Franciscan order was being divided by two factions of friars who called themselves respectively the Spirituales and the Relaxati. You can probably guess what each side stood for. The Spirituales wanted to keep the original and the strict rule of St. Francis, which is a good thing in itself, but unfortunately they, they went to certain extremes and introduced other errors into their position, which were not from St. Francis. And on the other side, the, the Relaxati were not ashamed to call for a more relaxed and cushier form of monasticism. But both sides were wrong, the, the relaxati for obvious reasons, and the spiritualas because of their, their other errors that they, they incorporated into their position. And they got their, these errors that they had from another book with a faintly ridiculous name called The Eternal Gospel which ended up being condemned by the Pope for all the, the, the errors that it contained, and it, it turned out to be not very eternal after all. But throughout all of these disputes, St. Bonaventure would, would take these people and unite them into a common cause, and unite them in the service of God. He's someone that we should pray to now, with so many divisions plaguing the, the few Catholics left who have the Catholic faith. As a doctor of the church, St. Bonaventure wrote many brilliant works on theology, but that wasn't the only thing that he wrote. He also wrote a number of devotional books for lay people, too. His writing is full of the most tender love of God and detachment from this world. He constantly thought about heaven, and, and in his writings, he tried to get other people to have a great desire for heaven, too. In one of his books, he wrote, God himself and all of the glorious spirits and the whole family of the eternal king wait for us and desire that we should be associated with them. And shall we not desire above all things to be admitted into their happy company? Of course, as the head of the Franciscans, he had a, a huge workload but he managed his time so well that he was always able to, to get his long prayers in every day without taking anything away from the duties to his order, which is really an example for us. We spend so much time doing mundane things that sometimes we don't have enough time to pray either, or we don't have enough time to pray, rather. 
But if we would try a little bit harder to make our prayers the important things, we would probably have the same experience that St. Bonaventure did. The prayer never gets in the way of our duties. One of his great achievements was to write a life of St. Francis of Assisi, who, of course, had been dead for less than a lifetime. He compiled all of the stories that everybody in living memory could remember about this great saint. He wrote them into a book, and most of the anecdotes that we have about the life of St. Francis of Assisi come from this book of St. Bonaventure. There's a famous story that St. Thomas Aquinas went to his cell once when he was working on the book, and he found him in ecstasy. And St. Thomas left him in peace. He said, let us leave a saint to write about a saint. In 1272, a new pope was elected. He called himself Pope Gregory X, who was also a very saintly man, and his cause for canonization has been introduced. And he sent a letter to St. Bonaventure telling him that he wanted to make him cardinal and bishop of Albano a city in Italy. But Pope Gregory knew that he was dealing with a very humble man, and so he also sent him another letter ordering him to accept this new duty, ordering him not to make any excuse about why he wouldn't be able to do it, but instead to come to Rome right away and to receive his new office. The Pope sent two papal envoys to go out and meet him on the road from Paris, and to give him the beautiful uh, purple cardinal's hat and the other insignia of his new office. And they found him resting from his journey at a Franciscan monastery outside of Florence. You can imagine their surprise when they came upon him washing dishes. And when they offered him the beautiful cardinal's hat... He held up his hands and he said, Oh, thank you. You know, my hands are really dirty right now. I can't take the hat. Can you please hang it on that tree over there and I'll be with you as soon as I'm done here. And then as soon as he was done with the dishes, he he went and received the papal envoys with, with proper dignity for the messengers of the Pope. The last great act of his life was the Second Council of Lyons, which Pope Gregory called in order to bring the Greek schismatics back into the Catholic Church and also to ask them to help to start a crusade against the Muslims and the Holy Land. St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas both went to the council, but of course St. Thomas Aquinas died on the way there at a monastery. But St. Bonaventure made it to the council, and when he was there, he sat at the right hand of Pope Gregory X. He gave the opening speech to all the bishops assembled from the entire world. And the Pope asked him to, to receive the legation from the Greeks and to talk to them. And he did, and his kindness and his holiness persuaded them to renounce their schism and to come back into the Catholic Church. It's fitting that the last great achievement of this man of peace was to reconcile, at least temporarily, the greatest schism in the history of the Church. Shortly after this, though, he became very sick, very suddenly, and he died shortly afterwards. He received extreme unction from Pope Gregory himself, And the cardinal who preached at his funeral mass would later become a pope himself. He became Pope Innocent V. Unfortunately, the reconciliation of the Greek schismatics was short-lived. As soon as that that emperor of Constantinople, who came back into the church, as soon as he died, his successor brought, brought the Greeks back into schism. The body of St. Bonaventure was desecrated by the Protestants in the 16th century. They burned his whole body except his head, at which the superior of the monastery that, that had his body was able to, to hide away from the heretics. And he kept it hidden at the cost of his life. He, he gave up his life rather than tell the heretics where this great relic was. 
But then, unfortunately, during the French Revolution, the Freemasons got a hold of, of the head of St. Bonaventure and desecrated it, and it has been lost and has never been found since. There's one last interesting footnote about the life of this great saint. If you remember, I said at the beginning of the sermon that he may well be a martyr. In 1905, someone discovered the notes of St. Bonaventure's personal secretary, a man named Peregrinus of Bologna. And in these notes, this man wrote that St. Bonaventure was poisoned to death. And if you look at it, the timing of his death is rather suspicious. He became very sick, very suddenly, as soon as he had reconciled the, the Greek schismatics with the Catholic Church. And that would have made him very unpopular with a lot of people who wanted to stay in schism. And those same people did bring the Greeks back into schism as soon as that, that emperor died. We'll probably never know for certain, but the Greeks of Constantinople at that time did have a reputation of using poison as their favorite means of getting rid of people that they didn't want to have around. So if that's the case, then St. Bonaventure adds the glorious crown of martyrdom to all of his other honors. It's unfortunate that this great saint is almost forgotten now. During his lifetime, he was one of the most prominent figures in Christendom. But now most people only know his name as the author of a very beautiful prayer after Holy Communion that, that the Church has incorporated into the Missal. If you say the prayers in the section for Thanksgiving after Holy Communion in your Missals, which I encourage all of you to do, you'll notice that in most Missals, the first prayer in that section is won by St. Thomas Aquinas. And after that, there's usually a prayer by St. Bonaventure, a very ardent prayer in which he asks God to pierce his heart with the fire of divine love until he loves nothing else in this world except God. I recommend you to read this prayer today after Holy Communion if you don't normally say it, because it gives us a glimpse into the soul of this great saint. And in fact, it paints a very beautiful and graphic picture of what the love of God really means in practical terms and how it should just consume us. And I thought I would end today with a quote from this prayer. In thee, O Lord, may my mind and my heart remain ever fixed and firm and rooted immovably forevermore. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.